Hey everyone, in this video I want to talk about how encryption works. A few videos ago I talked about how DNS worked. I could think about if I am some person on a client machine, and let's say for example, my name's Ethan. I found out one of my best friend's sons actually watches my channel, so hey Ethan. So I'm sitting at my client and I want to talk to some server. I can't draw a server, but we can imagine how it's got blinky lights and vents. This server, remember, I think of it as, and I refer to it as a fully qualified domain name that actually maps to one or more IP addresses. And the process used is I have a DNS client, I go and make a request to the DNS service if it's not already cached, so I'm saying, hey, what is fully qualified domain name? And what I get back is an IP address that I then want to go and communicate to. But if we think about that communication, everything on the web today is encrypted. Nearly any page you look at is always HTTPS. If I was to jump over quickly here to the page we're gonna use as part of the test today, this is my learn.onboardtoazure.com, but you'd see exactly the same thing on YouTube, where you may be watching this, we see this little padlock. And the padlock is telling us, hey, you're secure. We can see I'm also using HTTPS, not just regular HTTP. And that padlock gives me some information. Hey, the connection is secure. I can even go and see things about the certificate it's using, which we're gonna come back to. But the key point is we have that security. But what does that really mean? So we have encryption. So if I think about encryption, what is the point? What is the key goal that I want this to provide? Now the obvious one would be confidentiality. I don't want people to see what I'm doing, the transactions I'm making, entering credit card details, anything around that. And that's really the most obvious one. But there's other aspects that I need to ensure of when I'm doing these communications. I wanna make sure I'm really talking to this server. So I want some way to ensure the authenticity of who I'm talking to. It really is amazon.com or youtube.com or whatever that might be. I also have to think because, hey, the DNS could have got attacked. There could be some person in the middle. And if I think about that person in the middle as well, there could be some bad person. So somehow in the middle, maybe on, they're on the network, they're intercepting it, there could be some bad person, or they're always angry, we'll call that person Tim, for example, terrible human being. They might be trying to get in the middle and modify packets or redirect me. So I wanna make sure they can't do that. So I wanna also ensure the integrity of what I'm doing. And Tim is Ethan's dad, you may have guessed that already. So it's not just, hey, I want confidentiality. When I think about this security, I want to, yes, have that confidentiality, but I also wanna make sure it really is them and all of the ongoing communication is coming from them and I'm talking to them and that no one is flipping bits or doing padding in the middle to change something about what we're doing. So that's really the important thing of what I want to do. Now, I mentioned that padlock, and this is a step one. So I go and get the IP address, and then what I do is I start communication. So I have a communication flow to and from the server. And the key point is that we see this nice little padlock. I am secure. And the primary thing it's telling me about, the reason it's secure, is it's saying, well, there's this certificate. You have this cert that is ensuring that security. So let's go back and look at that in a little bit more detail. So if we go back to our site, and we go back and look at our connection is secure, we can actually go and look at our certificate we get basic information. We can see, hey, who it was issued by. So that's important, as we're gonna see later on. We can see a set of an expiry date, when it was issued. We see bits of information about it. We see a fingerprint of the certificate. 
But if we go to the details, we see some more interesting things that ultimately we are going to care about. What we'll see is this subject key info. I'm gonna see the algorithm it's using. So RSA encryption is the key part here. And then I'll see the public key. And there's two parts here. Now I want you to remember this first bit, modulus. Modulus we've heard about in math all the time. It's the remainder after division. It's the bit that's left over. If I did 12 divided by 10, well then the modulus is two. There's two left over. 10 goes into 12 one time and there's two left over. So remember this modulus, that's really important. Everything we're gonna do is around a modulus. But then also we'll see if we scroll down, a public exponent. And it's nearly always gonna be 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. And we'll come back to that. So that's hexadecimal, so 0x. And that's something that we're gonna use later on to take our value and hide it in such a way that only someone else with a special private version of that exponent will be able to decrypt it and get the original data back. So that's one part. Okay, that's security. But if we also look at our web page, so let's just right click, I can do inspect. And if I inspect, I can actually go and dig down into, let's go and look at all my elements, security. And once again, it's telling me, hey look, you've got this certificate, RSA 4096, SHA 256, blah, 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 blah. Your connection is secure, then it's given me a whole bunch of things. TLS 1.2 ECDHE underscore RSA with P256 and AS256 GCM. And they're actually the bits that are doing the encryption. That's actually the part we really, really care about. So if we flip back here for a second, if we look at those parts, so if we break this down and we can see that, okay, what did we have? Well, it was saying TLS. And in this case, it, it told us it was TLS 1.2, but then it had ECDHE underscore RSA with P256 and then AES256 GCM and SHA384. And it's basically boils down to all of this is known as our cipher suite. These various components will get used together to enable this encryption, but also this authenticity and the integrity. So we're gonna have all of those bits together to enable us to get that communication with what we want to do. And at a very high level, I can think of this first bit is how we're gonna exchange a secret. We need a secret between us. Because when I think about communications, well, if I wanna encrypt and decrypt, often the most efficient way of doing that is that there's some secret we both know about. This is how we're gonna share that secret over what is an insecure connection initially. I'm just over the internet. How do I share a secret? Well, that's how I'm gonna share the secret. This is gonna be how I'm actually gonna encrypt the traffic once we have that shared secret. And then sometimes I need to create hashes. So a hash really summarizes a whole big body of data into a fixed size. But it's such that if any element of that changes, that hash will be completely different. And that's what the SHA384 is going to do. So we're gonna have all of those pieces together. Now what I now wanna break down is this complete flow. So actually think about, okay, we have a client and we have a server, what actually happens? So to do this, and a bit of fun, what I'm actually gonna do is we're gonna open up Wireshark. So if I take Wireshark, what I did just ahead of time is I connected to that same learned on board to azure.com. And we can see the complete flow of packets. Now what you initially see is just TCP and you see a SYN from the client to the server, a SYNAC, 
from the server to the client, and then an ACK from the client to the server again. So three packets. So those three packets are setting up the initial TCP connection. So that's what we have to do first. We sit on top of TCP. So, okay, TCP. I'm going to, try to make sure I'm lined up roughly right. So I'm going to send to the server a SYN. The server is going to send back a SYN ACK. And then I'm sending a final ACK. We have now established a TCP session. Now the whole point of a TCP is we have layers. And I can think about, well, there's TCP, which I've now established. And then normally we just run HTTP on top of that. Hey, I've got my HTTP that I can send on top. But the problem is that would be unencrypted. Everyone could see that. So what I want to be able to do is on top of TCP, I'm gonna have TLS, Transport Layer Security. And it's the Transport Layer Security that then HTTP is gonna sit on top of to actually make this HTTPS and get me that confidentiality, that integrity, um, that authenticity of everything I'm doing. Now, when I talk about TLS, we really talk about versions 1.2 and 1.3. In You may hear it called SSL, um, Secure Sockets Layer. Secure Sockets Layer was, a, I think, a Netscape technology initially, and they went through various versions, but then there were different standards, and it was like, hey, look, we need a standard. So I think the National Institute, sorry, the Internet Engineering Task Force came together and said, let's create one standard we can all agree on. And it was basically SSL, but it was renamed to Transport Layer Security to not annoy any particular company that Netscape's protocol was chosen, <coughs> Microsoft, and TLS was born. So if you hear SSL, there are various versions of SLL, SSL. You may hear of TLS 1.1, all of those things. We are not using those anymore. They are considered not secure today. We don't want to do that. So we're going to think TLS 1.2 and 1.3. Now, 1.2 has been around a really long time. I think like 2008, whereas 1.3 has been around since about 2018. So you may say, why are we seeing 1.2 so much? Really boils down to the fact that 1.3 is not really, if I do the right choices of 1.2, any more secure. It's all about these cipher suites. There are lots of choices. And I guess the best analogy I could think of is TLS 1.2 is like the Cheesecake Factory menu. There are huge, huge numbers of options in this menu. Some of them are good, but there's lots of salads and things in here that I shouldn't eat. There's this there's, <laughs> bad thing, I don't like salads. There's things that I shouldn't do. So the number of Cypher Suites TLS 1.2 supports is huge, and there's some poor security ones in there. So I could pick poor security. What TLS 1.3 did, it's more like a Grimaldi's pizza menu, it's just good stuff. They got rid of all the insecure Cypher Suites. So they, they did a few other things, which I'll talk about at the end. But the point is, if I make the right decisions on my Cypher suite, 1.2 and 1.3 have the same level of security. I get a shorter handshake that we're gonna see. I can maybe do a few things about sending data quicker. But on the whole, the actual encryption is the same. It's just TLS 1.3 took away a lot of the older Cypher suites. So if I make good choices 1.2, I have the same level of security as 1.3. So there really is no issue with just using 1.2 still. And you'll probably get to see that for a really, really long time. Now, before I start talking about the actual transport layer security and the Cypher suite, I guess there's something important to just lay those foundations when I do think about encryption. So when I think of encryption, let's start over here, so lots of space. There are two types of encryption we, we think about. There's symmetric, and there's asymmetric. With symmetric, and we're actually probably most used to the idea of symmetrics. So you may have had one of these um, Caesar coins when you were a kid, like a decoder coin. 
And the whole point is you can slide it to a certain key number, let's say five or four, whatever, it doesn't matter. And you read off the letter, so A, well A has now become E. So my key in this case was four, that's my key that I'm shifting by. And then using that, I can see what my new letter is. I'm substituting a letter at a time. So to decrypt it, I use the same key. It's still four, but I just read it the other direction. Oh, I was sent an E, oh, that's A. So with a symmetric, the point is we have some plain text. I run it through some encryption algorithm with a key K that's gonna give me my encrypted payload, whatever that is. But then if I run it through an encryption, a decryption algorithm, but I'm gonna use the same key, it's exactly the same key here, then I get the plain text again. So that's symmetric. And in this example, our key could just be, okay, I'm shifting down plus three or something. Obviously I wouldn't have ended up with this, I'd have ended up with four characters shifted over, etc. You get the idea. But one of the important things to think about is if we take our Caesar coin for a second, so remember our Caesar coin had all of the letters A, B, C, all the way through to Z. Then we had an inner wheel which also had all the letters, but it has a little window where I can set the counter, for example. Well, it wouldn't have been there. Let's just draw this the right way. It has a little counter, maybe I set it to here, and I set it to two, so now A is here, B. So I've shifted a certain number. So in this case, what is my, I'm just spinning around, I'm adding two. Now the problem is if I add two all the time and there's only 26 letters, I might come out at 28. There is no letter 28. So what we've actually done here, this is something called modulus 26. Remember modulus is just the remainder after division. So if I'd spun round and I've got, I don't know, letter 28, we'll take away 26 and then maybe I'll get back to B. The whole point is I'm just spinning round. So it keeps me within a certain size. So I'm within this finite field of really A to Z. They're the elements that I can have within my finite field of letters, A to Z. So if I go off the end, well, I just come back. I'm just looping round within those 26 characters. We're used to this idea more on time. If you think of a clock, well there's 12, one, two, three, four, six, nine, well it's 12 hours. If I said it's one o'clock and I said add 12 hours, well a clock is mod 12. Add 12, well it's 13, take away 12, it's one o'clock. Add 14 hours, okay, it's that makes it 15, well it's three o'clock. If I go back in time, hey, take away two hours, well I can't have minus one, so I would add 12, so now I'm at 11. So I'm always within, again this time at a finite field, essentially of one to 12, um, zero to 11, uh, ideally on that. So 13 becomes one, and 25 would become one, etc. So we're used to this idea every day that there's a modulus. When we tell time, we're very good at modulus. Hey, it's three o'clock, what time would it be in 36 hours? Well, I can do that, 12, 12, 12, it'd still be three o'clock, but just now it's shifted, is it afternoon versus p.m.? And that's an interesting point though. When we modulus, if all I know is the end number, let's say I told you three, and I said I started at one o'clock, how long did something take me? You don't know. It could have took me two hours, could have took me 14 hours, could have took me 26 hours. You get the idea. 
I don't know how many times I spun around. So with modulus, I'm losing data. I'm losing the actual number of times it actually went into this number. So typically modulus is very useful for things like hashing and where I just need to keep something within a finite value. But if I just told you I started at one, I finished at three, you might guess it's two just out of context, but you don't know that. You do not know how many times round that hour spun. Okay, so we get the idea of the clock. We understand the whole point of that. Now with our Caesar cipher, it doesn't matter that we loop round and we're modulus in 26. We know there's only 26 letters. We know if it essentially comes out at minus two. Well, we know we have to get back to that one to 26. We don't lose information because our modulus is 26 and there's only 26 elements. So we, we, we're only gonna shift back round. We're not gonna risk losing any data with our Caesar cipher. So symmetric's great and it's very, very fast. Symmetric is very, very efficient. In computers, we love to use symmetric. But there's a problem with the symmetric. The problem is the key. How to share it. At school, you may tell your friend, hey, let's use key five today, whatever that is. You, you had an out of band way to share the cipher you're gonna use, to share the key. But on the internet, how would I do that? If there's no existing relationship, if I have no existing shared information, how can I just use symmetric from the outset? Because there's nothing shared between us. How can I securely share that key? We'll come back to that. So we have asymmetric. So asymmetric, there's two keys. I can really think about my first key and then I can think about a second key. And we think about one of them the key is public, and one of them, the key is private. And they're really the inverse of each other. I never, I'll do this in red, never share your private key. The whole fabric of the universe will start to unravel if you ever share your private key. But what this allows me to do is if I take a message, hello, and if I encrypt it, so there's some encryption function, and I encrypt it with the public key, so now I'm gonna go and get the, the garbled, whatever that is, the decryption, whatever the decryption function is, I have to use the private key, and then I get back to the original. I cannot use the public key again to decrypt. And this works vice versa. So I could also go the other direction. I could encrypt something with my private key, and then people with my public key could decrypt it. Now if you think about that, I'm gonna use this in two very, very different ways. Because remember, everyone, it's public. Everyone knows my public key. So if I wanted to send something securely, encryption with my private key is completely useless because everyone has my public key. But the way I could think about it is if I did wanna send something, so if I wanted confidentiality, then absolutely, I'll have my message and right, I'll encrypt it with the person who I'm sending it to, private key. And then I'll send it. So this is gonna give me confidentiality. Only they have the private key. Only they can then take it and decrypt it. So if I wanna send something to someone and I wanna have it encrypted, I encrypt it with their public key that everyone knows but remember, only the private can decrypt it. Whereas, maybe I want to send something, I've got a message, but what I actually wanna do is I wanna prove I sent the message, the content of this, and it's not been tampered with along the way. So what I can do is I can generate a hash value 
which remember a hash summarizes, no matter how big this is, summarizes the content of that into a fixed size. And then, well, I'll encrypt this with my private key. <coughs> the message is still plain text. I can still send that and everyone could read it. So now I'm sending this, but what does this does? This proves, <coughs> excuse me, authenticity. Providing when the other end decrypts this with my public key that everyone has, generates the hash as well, and the hash value based on the message matches the one that was encrypted. Well, I know also it's not been messed with. The integrity of that message is assured. And because they did encrypt this, it means they had the private key, which means they must be that person. So those things together, hey, prove that it really came from them and it proves no one messed with it. I'm just gonna move that out of the way so it doesn't get confusing. So this is how I can use symmetric. I can, yes, I can send things confidentially by encrypting it with their public key and they can prove they really sent this and it's not been messed with by creating a hash, which is that summary of the data and encrypting it with their private key and attaching it to the end and sending it. I can then work out the same hash of the message because that algorithm will be public, decrypt this with the public key and they match. So I now feel pretty good that really came from them. So these two concepts of the public and the private is really important because we're gonna use both of these. This idea of having this capability to hey, have some key that's very efficient for encrypting and decrypting, but also the idea that there's another type of asymmetric encryption where it's two different keys. One of them is kept private and then one of them is public. And these keys are all built around very, very large prime numbers and a modulus, which is what you saw in that public certificate. You saw a modulus and then you saw a public exponent that I'm gonna raise to the power of that number. Now, one thing may initially start to think just straight away, hey, I could just take this key and encrypt it with their public key and send it to them. That's a great way to share a key. And there are cipher suites that do exactly that. Uh, RSA will take the client, creates the secret, called a, a pre-master secret, encrypt it with the other one's public key and send it to them. There's a problem with that. I don't have forward secrecy and I'm gonna come back and talk to that in a lot more detail. But this is the key point. These two types are gonna be everything we do. So now we understand symmetric and asymmetric. Let's come back to our, we've done TCP. Now I want this TLS part. This is the whole point, right? I want to now talk TLS. And the first thing we have is a handshake. I have to agree certain things. So we have a handshake protocol. And this is where everything happens. If we go back to our Wireshark, we see we had the three TCP packets. And then straight away, we see this thing called a client hello coming from the client to the server. So if we look at this client hello packet, now one of the nice things Wireshark does is it actually breaks it down so we can see the different components. And straight away, well, it's that it's a TLS 1.2 record layer the version of the handshake is 1.0. The reason it's 1.0 is currently, we don't know what the server does. This is me starting off the conversation. So I have to start off assuming the worst. So I'm just gonna use 1.0 as the handshake. Um, so I'm sending, hey, I'm speaking 1.0, but hopefully you're gonna do something better much, much quickly. So it's a client, hello. I'm gonna tell it, the highest version of TLS I support. So I'm saying, hey, I support 1.2. This is a lie. This machine actually supports 1.3. And we're gonna see this later on. But it has to consider compatibility. So right now it's gonna say, I speak 
and then it's gonna bury down a bit deeper saying, I also speak 1.3, just PS. So, we have the version. We have something called a client random. This is gonna be important later on. It has a time in as well, but this client random helps to stop certain types of replay attacks. We're also gonna use it as part of a secret generation we're gonna use later on. You might hear this called a nonce. It's not to be used more than once, but we have this. Then, we have this whole set of cipher suites. There's a lot of them. So this is all of the cipher suites that this client can support. Now notice, we have, if I can find it, I think this is our one, right? TLS, EC, DHE, RSA with AES, 256, GCM, SHA, 384. Hexadecimal, zero X is hexadecimal, C030. So that's one of the ones I support. I also support, notice things like TLS underscore RSA. That underscore RSA is where I would send the secret just encrypted with their public key. So those cipher suites do exist, it's just we don't like them very much. But totally we see that is there and I could be using that. So it's that this is everything I can do. Now there can also be things like a session that could be in there. There can be things like compression methods I could include. And then you're gonna see there's a whole bunch of extensions that for right now, I'm gonna pretend aren't there for the most part. But I'll give you a hint of a few things. So something interesting we'll see is there's this extension called supported versions that just happens to say it also supports TLS 1.3. You'll also see there's some weird things around a key share. None of this is used for TLS 1.2. But there's a whole stuff, it's actually sending 32 bytes. So it's sending over here a bunch of, was it 256 bits, it's sending a key. And it's sending some other group, whatever that is, it's sending some stuff. It also sends things like supported groups, which are again, some of those same values we're seeing in the key share. So it's sending some other things. And the reason it's sending those other things is in case the server speaks TLS 1.3. So if it speaks TLS 1.3, we can do some different things. But let's summarize where we are right now. So as part of the TLS handshake, initially, what the client is gonna send is the client hello. So we're sending the client hello. And the client hello is, hey, what is my max TLS version? knowing it's lying a little bit. We say, what is my client random? Remember, this is all sent unencrypted. This is just out there. This is over TCP. There is no established encryption session yet. We're trying to do that. And I'm saying the bunch of cipher suites. Now again, there was other stuff I could send like the encryption, but none of that is really pertinent when I'm thinking about the encryption. So these are the cipher suites I support. So I'm sending all of that to the server. Now the server, remember, is configured with its service. In that service, I tell it, for example, hey, what is your configuration? You have software that supports TLS 1.2 or 1.3. These are the cipher suites I'm gonna enable. Hey, I might be 1.2, but I've ripped out pages of the Cheesecake Factory menu that I don't think are very good. So I'm only gonna allow certain things. So now what's gonna happen? Well, let's look at the wire trace. If we're gonna look at the wire trace, the next thing we see is the server hello. Now the server hello has a whole bunch of stuff in it, but it's basically been told by the client, hey, I support this version of TLS. These are the cipher suites I support. So the server is now gonna say, this is what we're gonna do. Notice it's handshake version has bumped up to 1.2. It knows the client supports it. It knows it supports it. So it's not using 1.0, it's using 1.2. It's saying we're going to use version 1.2. It generates a server random and it's telling them this is the cipher suite you are going to use. If I keep scrolling down, 
Once again, there's some extension stuff in here. There's the compression method, etc., etc. But that's the server hello. Now, let's just stop at that part, first of all. So if we go and look, we're now sending back to the client the server hello. In the server hello, it's telling it the final TLS version. It's telling it my server random, again, to help protect against replay, but also that combined with this thing we're gonna have called a pre-master secret, is gonna be used to create the master secret that then gets split off to create the actual symmetric encryption keys. And it's gonna tell me the cipher suite that has been chosen. And this is matching what we saw in the browser. So remember, the, it's a big long string. I'll try and write it out, but I'm probably gonna mess it up. So we saw TLS, elliptic curve, Diffie-Hellman, ephemeral with RSA with, okay, I'm gonna run out of space, um, AES256, Galois counter mode, wait, there should have been a hash, uh, underscore, underscore, SHA384. All of this, remember, this is our cipher suite. It does not send this great big long string. What it sent was hexadecimal C30. And we can see that in the wire trace. So if we look at the wire trace again, what we actually see it sent was, sure, it's showing us this pleasant thing on the left, but on the right, if you look at the actual bits it sent, it sent C030. It's just that Wireshark is really nice to us and goes and looks these up for us. There is a list of all these. So these are all the TLS cipher suites. And this is a chart. These are all the different ones you could use. And if we keep scrolling down, we'll see, there we go, 30. And this is us. So Wireshark is just doing this for us. And there's the RFC, so I can go and look at details about all of these different elements, if that's something I'm interested in. As I mentioned before, what are these parts doing? So remember this, this is how I'm gonna generate the shared key that I can then use for the symmetric encryption. This is how I'm actually going to use that key. So I'm gonna use that key to actually do the encryption. And then this, is how I'm gonna do hashing when I need a hash. I'm gonna use the SHA-384. So that's the key important part. This is how we're actually gonna do the security. This big string, which was actually two bytes, that's gonna to map to that. But it sent other stuff as well. It also sent a certificate. Now it sent a bunch of stuff in the certificate. So if we look at the certificate, so I'm on the certificate part, it was sent in the same packet. It sent me two certificates. So the first certificate, I can look at it, but I can see in the name, I can see the certificate is actually for my learn.onboard2azure.com. I can see that's in there. But I can also see, hey, who issued this certificate? So that's who issued it. And then what I'll also see is there's a signature of this, which was signed by the person that issued it. And then I also include the certificate that signed this certificate. And there would be a whole chain of these certificates until eventually I get to one that was signed by a root certificate authority. So here, this DigiCert root, global root CA, this is a root certificate authority. So I have a chain of certificates here. 
And it's saying, hey, these are the certificates that I'm gonna use. This is me. This is how I'm gonna prove authenticity when we're talking. So now, I'm sending certificate. So we have the server hello part. In the same packet, I'm also sending my certificate. Now remember, my certificate is, well, yes, there's my certificate. So this is me. This is my fully qualified domain name, or maybe it's a wild card cert, whatever that is. This was signed by some intermediary CA. Basically, they're, they're someone who can sign other certificates. And this was actually signed, and again, there could be other levels. It's just a hierarchy, a bit like DNS in a way. This was signed by some root that is trusted. And we could see this chain when we look in the browser. So if I go to the browser, and we go back to my onboard to Azure, and I go back and look at the certificates, hey, I can view the certificate, I can see the details, it's showing me the chain. This is my cert, my cert was signed by this cert, and we saw both of these certs in the packet, and then, hey, look, this is this root CA that signed this as well. So there's multiple certificates that are actually part of this chain. Now, what about that root certificate? How do we know to trust the root certificate? Well, if I run certificate manager, let's drag this over here so you can see. So this is me just looking at all the certificates on my machine. There's a trusted root certificate that's just built into it. Now on some devices, this might be part of the OS. Some devices, this might be part of the browser. And these are all of the certificates that are trusted by the OS. And here is that one, Digital Root, sorry, Dig DigiCert Global Root CA. There's a whole other bunch of them. Notice how long these live. These are really, really long lived. This is why these certificates are typically locked up in a vault, like they're secured away, because if this leaked, if someone got hold of this private key, you could basically unravel all of the encryption that's going on. This is also why you have to be really careful of adding other certificates to this trusted list. Now, often your company will have its own certificate authority. So when I talk about the, the list of certs over here, like your company probably has its own root CA, and they will add that certificate directly into your trusted root, because they have to. Their internal PKI is not signed by some global authority but they need you, they're gonna issue device certs and other certificates that make your company work. So you're gonna probably see that in your trusted root. But if you get some weird piece of software that says, hey, I wanna install this certificate as a trusted root, why? Because realize, as soon as someone is a trusted root, I could do very bad things. All of our communication is based on the fact that the authenticity of who I'm talking to is being proven by the fact that they have the private key for this certificate. And that private key was checked in a way, the certificate was verified by someone we trust. So these root certificate authorities are very, very highly trusted companies. And then the intermediaries, well, they have to prove to these roots that they can be trusted. And they're gonna do a thorough check when people ask them for a cert. So then when I go as my company and ask them for a cert, they're gonna do checks to make sure I'm really Savile Tech or on board to Azure.com or Microsoft or Amazon or whoever that is. Their job is to only give out a certificate if they're sure you are. So it's a chain of trust, essentially, because we trust the roots. They do a good job checking the intermediaries that are worthy to give out certificates. The intermediaries do a really thorough job of making sure you really are who you say you are. If I have some weird thing stuck in the middle, as a trusted authority, if they manage to get in the middle of my network communications and can grab the packets, they could create a cert that says, oh yeah, I'm, I'm youtube.com, or I'm google.com, or I'm microsoft.com, honest. And they'll sign it themselves because they're in your trusted route. So when you go and look and say, oh, was this really signed? Yeah, it's by a trusted root authority. It was signed by a trusted root authority. You'll trust that cert. 
Now the signer wouldn't be some normal, it'd be whatever this company name is, but the computer not knowing any difference. Unless some human went and looked, they'd be like, well, this is weird. Why is this cert being signed by this weird certificate authority over here? It's how TLS inspection works. If you have some piece of software that you want to be able to do a packet inspection of encrypted communications, I have to be able to issue those certs. Azure Firewall, if I turn on TLS inspection, it requires to be given a certificate that is trusted by the clients so it can generate certificates for all of the sites you may visit so we can get in the middle. It will generate its own cert for that target site. So your TLS session essentially ends with the the monitoring system in the middle, Azure Firewall, and it creates a separate connection out so it can see unencrypted, it unencrypts it in between all of the traffic. That's how I can still monitor traffic. TLS inspection requires me to be able to create certificates for other sites, so I have to trust that. Long way of saying, be really careful of things that you add. So if I am on my client machine over here, realize it has a set of trusted root CAs. Don't just go and add other things to that. That's generally gonna be a very, very bad idea and opens you up to potential attacks. So it's including the certificate, which it would be able to validate by looking at the chain, checking on the signatures. And then also, what it does is we can see, remember we've agreed the cipher suite at this point, so then it also includes a server key exchange. So it's saying, hey, okay, let's actually start to exchange some keys. That's gonna let us do that symmetric key, that shared secret we're gonna have. I'm using that elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman and it's some parameters. This is not gonna make sense. It's a curve, what? Here's a curve name. Here's my public key. Pretty big, what's that? Roughly 512, um, no, it's not right. Pretty, pretty big there. Um, and then there's the signature key length. So what it's doing, and this is the interesting part, so it's generating its server parameters, and then it's signing it. So this is the important part here. It's generating its part that it's sharing with me on this unencrypted network, remember, but then it's signing it. It's using that certificate to generate a signature. So this is how it's proving, hey, look, here's the bits of the server key exchange we're gonna do, but this is really me. Remember, you can trace back. It's gonna sign it with this certificate. So it's adding on the server key exchange. So now it's doing a server key exchange Again, the same packet, is it all in the same packet? So it's what it's sending me at this point is, hey, it's that public key. It's part of the public key. It has kept back a private key part. We'll see this later on. And it's sending me the parameters. And then what it did with all of this stuff is it signed it. And it, so it took this certificate created a summary of this stuff and signed it. So it's sending that as well. And then also we saw it then said a message server, hello, done. In the Wireshark, right at the bottom, server hello done. Nothing interesting, all done now, finished. So that's the server, so right now at this point, we have done one round trip. Let me just close this out, I don't need that anymore. We have done one round trip of communication. Client hello, server hello. Now, we're gonna do the next part. So the next part, again, if we go back and look at our trace through here, is the client now sends a client key exchange. So it is sending its part. So it's this elliptic curve, Diffie-Hellman 
and it's sending its public key, so it's 65 bytes. Again, it's roughly 500 bits. My brain is struggling, it's Sunday morning. Um, so it sends its part, its public key, and then it's sending a message, change cipher spec, everything you see on this point on, I'm gonna be encrypted. I'm switching over. And then it sends an encrypted handshake message. So what this is gonna do is it's gonna take a summary of all of the communication thus far and encrypt it with the key that they can now both work out. So we sent the server hello. I am now gonna send my client key exchange, which is really sending my public key. The parameters were sent by the server. So I send it my part that we're gonna to mix together to generate a shared secret. I'm then saying, hey, I wanna change and I'm gonna send it an encrypted handshake, a summary of everything we've done so far. So I send that over and then on the server side, it then sends back the same thing. Change cipher spec, yep, agreed, we're switching over, everything's gonna be encrypted and then it sends its encrypted handshake message. And again, all of this is in one packet. So then, okay, final, so this is the second round trip. So in total, we've done two round trips. So we're saying change, cipher, spec, and then we've done that same encrypted handshake. That's, that's the handshake protocol. So in total, what we've done is two round trips. So it was a hundred milliseconds round trip latency, maybe a, a quarter of a second. I mean, it, it's fast. TLS 1.3 can make this one round trip. So it halves that time. That's really one of the big deals with TLS 1.3. But we're now ready. We are now ready to actually start using, we use a slightly different color now, the TLS record protocol. So there's two parts of TLS, the handshake protocol and the record protocol. The record protocol is what I use to now actually send data. And that's what we see. If we now look at the wire trace, there's no more handshake stuff. The wire trace now just says app data. And we can see it say application data protocol. And then I can't see anything anymore. At this point, all I see is encrypted app data. I can't read it, it's all encrypted. So everything now is just this sets of encrypted data. So all of this, remember, was unencrypted. To this point, apart from those encrypted handshakes, this was all sent unencrypted. But what it's enabled us to do with the client hello, the server hello, and then the client key exchange, those packets have now shared enough material through those public keys and the client random and the server random, along with, in this case, the parameters for the server key exchange, that they can both now go and generate a master secret that they're then gonna be able to actually go and use to do all the other encryption. You can really think about the, the protocol as me coming into the restaurant saying, hey, I like burgers, pizza, and steak. So I'm giving it a list of the foods I'll eat, the cypher sweets I support. The restaurant looks at that list and says, you can order pizza. And so I say, okay, I'd like a pizza. Here are my toppings. And then it reads back, okay, yep, you're gonna get a pizza with those toppings. So it's all this encrypted data. And one of the points is with this data, we can now generate this master secret, but it's not forever. One of the things we'll see is it's ephemeral, it's short-lived. 
anytime, if we close the browser, if we close the session, it's gonna do all of this work again. It's gonna recreate a whole new set. It will renegotiate. There are features where I can resume. There can be a pre-shared key. So maybe I could get, use some previous parameters I have, but for the most part, hey, I'm just gonna renegotiate this every time. So okay, that's at a high level, but I've glossed over everything. Um, let's look at the individual components of how this actually works. So the first thing was how to share the secret. And I said the solution to how the, to share the secret was this E C D H E underscore R S A. Elliptic curve Diffie Hellman ephemeral RSA. Okay. But remember there was the version that was just RSA. Why did we say we didn't want to just use the RSA. The whole point here is, uh, sure I could. I could absolutely have the client, the client could generate the pre-master secret. The client could then encrypt that with the key of the server, it's public key, and send it to the server. And this is what RSA does. Forget about this underscore RSA, this, that's used for the validation of the authenticity, it's not used to actually share the secret. So this is what RSA would do, if I wasn't using Diffie-Hellman. What's the problem with this? Because it looks good. At the other end, I know the private key, so I could decrypt it, and then I could get out the pre-master secret. If one day that key was broken, if one day the server's key was exposed in some way, and let's say I've been sitting here sniffing the packets for years, I've just put it all in a file, if at some point in the future I break the key, I can go back to years of captured data and decrypt it all, and then read everything they ever sent. So this is not good because it has something called no forward secrecy. If at some point I break this key, either I work it out or it leaks, I can go back in time for everything I've ever captured and I can look at it. What I want is perfect forward secrecy that it doesn't matter what happens at some point in the future, it's not gonna help them go back and see what I did. And this is exactly what Diffie-Hellman does. So, we're gonna start with this whole concept of Diffie-Hellman. Now the important thing to realize, this is all happening on an unencrypted network. This is before I have the, the secret. So I can't rely on anything else. So how, if I'm on an open public network, can I work out something only we know when we can only talk out in the open? That's a difficult thing. So we have the idea of, we'll say there's Ethan again, and then there's the server they're trying to talk to. Could be a person. These technologies I'm talking about for a website, but this applies to many, many other types of things. It could be a peer-to-peer -peer type communication, could be my VPN and my IPsec. We use the same technologies. I'm gonna use a very silly analogy initially, but you'll get the idea. There's gonna be a public color. So actually I'll draw this out as public. So there's stuff, the public, that's just out in the open because it's sent over the network. So it's public because someone could sniff the traffic. So I'm gonna have a shared color. Ethan is gonna come up with a private color, and the server will come up with a private color. What they're each gonna do now is take the public color and mix it. So what they'll do is they'll create a mix. Now obviously blue and yellow is gonna give me a green, and this is basically gonna be shared out in the public domain. Red and yellow would give me an orange. So this is all out in the public. 
Now, one of the things to understand with colors, it's a little bit dumb because if I was given orange and I knew yellow, I could work out red. I totally get that. But imagine this is more complicated colors and more complicated math. It's something called a trap door. And the, the idea of a trap door is I can go one way, I can't go the other. So all of this is trap door and it's built on a one way. This way is very easy to go. To try and go the other way is very, very hard. And what we're gonna see is this very, very hard is all gonna be based around raising things to the power. And then very hard is trying to work out um, the log, that's the discrete log problem. It's very, very hard to go the other way. Point is, they're gonna generate these shared colors and share them. And then privately, they can mix those colors. Now I don't have brown, it would be a weird, brown color, but let's just pretend when you mix orange with blue, you get this color. When you mix green with the color, you're gonna get the same color. Person in the public sees green and sees orange, but you can't just mix orange and green. You'd have too much yellow. It wouldn't be the same color. But these know their private color and they can mix it. So this is gonna work. They're gonna end up with the same color. So they have the same secret that's, that's gonna work. Okay, it doesn't use colors, which you've probably guessed already. Um, but it works on the same principle, but it's based on math and how some things are easy to go if I know certain things in one direction, but it's nigh on impossible for computers that would take thousands of years to go the other way. So this is all gonna work around some very, very large prime numbers. You're gonna see prime numbers and modulus in everything we do. All of encryption is based around prime numbers and modulus. So what we're gonna want is a generator. This is public, this is gonna be sent over the public network, it's visible. And I'm gonna have a modulus. Remember, this is the thing the, it's the remainder after division. This is gonna be very, very large um, number, a super large number. And it's generated, um, for the, but it's gonna be at large prime, super large. And when we say very large, we normally talk about like 2048 bits plus, it's those sorts of numbers. And we're gonna do the same thing again. But this time, instead of colors, so these numbers are out in the open. What's gonna happen is I'm gonna generate a secret C, and this will generate a secret S. All I'm gonna do is this shared generator, I'm gonna say G to the power of this mod the prime, and I'll share that. Meanwhile, they're gonna do G to the S mod, the prime, and they're gonna send it to me. I then take the number that was sent to me and then raise it to mine. So I was now basically given G to the S mod P, and I'm gonna raise it to C. They were given G to the C, they're gonna raise it to S. These will be the same number. But the point is, although these were shared on the public, I can't reverse that. Knowing G and the prime, and knowing what this the result is, I can't reverse that number. Mathematically, in the way computers work, I can't do that. This modular exponentiation is super difficult to try and undo. Like, that's why we pick very large key sizes. If I think about the the math of what we're doing, remember, I have the generator, well, I know my private key. I'm raising it to my private key, mod that prime. And what this generates is my public key that everyone can know. But if I try and go the other way, so if all I know is mod P, 
and I know the public, I, I, I don't know what that is. I don't know the private key. The, that is the whole idea of this, the log, I guess G, and I know the public key. This is super hard. It's considered, with this Diffie-Hellman, Diffie is at least as hard as solving this discrete log problem. If someone finds an efficient way of doing this on these very large numbers, then this is all in trouble. Because this is at least as hard as this. But, um, they don't believe, and, and people also massively think of things like, well, quantum computing, it doesn't solve every problem that exists in the world. And this is one of those things where this probably doesn't actually completely change uh, everything about it. it. It makes some types of encryption easier, it might half the key length effectiveness, but it doesn't completely wipe this out. Now, the reason this works is g to the power of s to the power of c is actually exactly the same as g to the s times c. That is why it works. So this would be the same as, it's the same math. It doesn't change anything about what we're actually doing. Um, we could see this, I guess. So let's, uh, let's do a very silly example again, because I can't do math that big. You will see me maybe say the word magic. Uh, was it any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic? In my case, it's any sufficiently advanced concept that I can't understand, I will say is magic. But for right now, let's say g equals five. I'm gonna forget about the mod part for now. It, it doesn't really change anything about what I wanna do. And I'll say the private here is three, and the private here is seven. I'm just doing super, super easy numbers. So we could imagine, I will do five to the three, send that over, they would do five to the seven, send that over, and then I'll take their number and raise it to three, they'll take my number and raise it to seven. So if we look to the calculator, so let's actually just see this in action super, super quickly. So if I take five to the power of three, and that's what I would have sent, 125, right? And then they're gonna take it and raise that to the power of seven. And then obviously you would mod that to get to some nicer usable number. Um, I don't know what a good number is to do. Let's just do mod 12, that should be safe. Just so it looks like something usable. It would be a prime that doesn't, but let's just say it came out as five, okay? If I went the other way, if I did five, to the power of seven, and then raise that to the power of three. Well, notice straight away, they're the same number. I can see, even though I reverse the order, I end up with the same number. So when I mod it, I'm gonna end up with five. And it's exactly the same as, well, if I just do seven times three, which were my two exponents, two things I'm raising to the power, so 21. If I just do five to the power of 21, it's that same number again. And notice it took a little bit of time. The computer's like, oh, this is a big number. So it doesn't matter the order in which I apply them. I'm gonna end up with exactly the same number. That's, that's really the key point between all of these things. So that enables me to take the number and share it. And if we look at the standards, it talks about the sort of sizes of the keys and what they would use. And you can see they're big. Like these are not, there's some values included in here. Hey, look, it's a prime, it's a hexadecimal value of a 1,536 of a 2,048. So these are big, big numbers um, to make this work. Because I need to make sure that discrete log problem is difficult to do. If my log numbers were too small, hey, I can solve that discrete log problem. So this is a key thing that we're gonna make sure we have. So great, I can, I can share keys. Those keys are really, really big to make it work. And computers are fast, but remember, I might wanna have this communication with a, a smart card, a small device. 
And so yes, this works, but those size of those keys is problematic. And you would notice when we actually looked at our configuration, it didn't say Diffie-Hellman. It said elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman. Okay, curve. What, what's, what's going on here then? So instead of doing this, raising to the power, we're gonna use a curve. We're gonna use an elliptic curve. The elliptic curve has a formula. Y squared equals X to the power of three plus A X plus B. So I'm giving it as inputs A and B. So these are parameters that I feed in as part of this. So remember A and B, I'm feeding these in. And what this is gonna do is create a curve. Now, depending on the parameters, the look of the curve can be different. But what it will boil down to is it's gonna look something like, I don't know, that's not that good. It should be symmetrical. It should mirror on this x-axis. So this is the whole point of elliptic curve. If I show you one that's not me drawing it terribly. So this is a calculator and I already prepared a formula so I paste in the formula and add all of them. If I change A to I don't know, minus three-ish and B to three, you can see the curve. So it creates this elliptical curve based on what those values, those parameters. But you can see, as I change the parameters, it changes the curve. But notice it's always symmetrical on that X axis. Now, there are additional properties to this. I am simplifying this massively. I have to simplify it massively because there are other equations that this has to satisfy to be valid for our purposes. I cannot have um, singular curves where there's some point that now ceases to behave itself based on our rules. There's always a point known as infinity. This is shown as a simple zero. That's part of this whole thing. There are group laws. And one of this is the inverse of a point is its mirror on the x-axis. I never have more than three aligned points on a line. So if I was to draw a line, there's only ever three points on a line. Doesn't matter what I do, there's never more than three points that make up the line. Because we're gonna use that fact when I wanna add points together. So if we go back to our picture, for right now, I'm just gonna pick some points. So I'm gonna pick point. Um, let's do purple. That's a terrible color to pick when I'm trying to differentiate. We'll do point P. I'm going to draw a point Q. If I want to add those points together, now what I should do is actually use the ruler function here. But what I would do is I will draw a straight line between them. And then I inverse so let's say that was point R. I don't want that point. This is the point that I care about. This point here is what we would consider P added to Q. It's flipped. If I then wanted to add, um, again, I, I'm always taking the intersection and I have to flip it. Now you might say, why, am I, why do I have to do the flipping? There's certain rules. P plus Q plus R must equal zero, which means, well, P plus Q equals minus R from that mathematics. The minus means the flip. But also what we're gonna do, let's just draw this out. What we're gonna do is we have to add something to itself over and over. What is multiplication? If I said two times five, what is the answer? Well, really it's two plus two plus two plus two plus two. Plus two. Multiplication is really just adding something to itself a certain number of times. And that's what this is all gonna be based on. If I take this same picture again, I'm gonna try and draw roughly the same graph. It's not really that important, but I've got some, I've drawn that terribly, but you get the idea. That should be symmetrical. That's really not symmetrical at all. That's like the worst symmetrical thing in the universe. Imagine it was, use your imagination that was actually symmetrical. Let's say with that, 
still not symmetrical, but you get the idea. I'm gonna start off with a generator. So the same way we had a generator before, I'm gonna have a generator point. Remember, when I used Diffie-Hellman, I had a generator that was public. Everyone could know about. I just had, generator was a color. It was some number that I was gonna to raise to some number. Well, this time, the generator is a point. So the generator is this. And what we're gonna to wanna to do in all of our math here is multiply it a certain number of times. Well, remember, multiplication is just adding to itself, to itself, to itself, to itself. Now initially, how do I draw a line um, if it's just one point? Well, g plus g, if they were the same point, would basically be the tangent, the straight line. So imagine, I don't know, that's the tangent. It's not quite right, but you get the idea. So g plus g, imagine that was actually going through the line, if I'd drawn it better. So the intersection was here, and then I flip it. So this would be 2g. g plus g, tangent, where does it intersect, flip it? 2g. And where's 3g? Well, this time, because remember, this is the point I wanna keep adding g. So that's a straight line. Oh, I've drawn that terribly. But maybe that's the line. It should only ever intersect once. So yeah, that's actually, that, that works. So that's the intersect point. Okay, and then I'm gonna go up. Okay, that point is 3G. Where's 4G? You get the idea. 4G, okay, well that intercepts here, and then you flip it, that will be 4G. And et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, well, where's this line? Well, 5G would be up here to flip, so 5G would be down here somewhere. And you can imagine as I'm adding, I'm just bouncing around this. This is what it's all based on. I'm now this generator. And what the secrets are gonna be is how many times I times G by some number. The client will times it by a certain number of times, the server will times it. But again, it's just addition. So if they times it a certain number of times, and then someone else times that position by a number of times, they'll end up at the same endpoint. That's the whole point of what we're going to do here. So you can see how this is working. The problem is like a curve of this nature, that's not ideal for what we wanna do. So just like in everything else we've ever done, we want the numbers within a certain value. I, I don't like this just goes off in anything we can. So, we're gonna take this curve, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna basically apply it into a fixed field. So what this is gonna use is this whole idea of a finite field or a, a Galois field. So I'm gonna have a finite field of this modulus, so P. I'm gonna have this prime. So this is a big night prime number again. And so I can think about this field, this funny thing, of this prime. And when you see finite, it's also called Galois. I think I spelled that right, I hope. So Galois, oh, we, we saw elliptic curve um, Diffie-Hellman. And then we remember there was still that GCM on the AES encryption. Okay, Galois. So it's here as well. It's just a finite field. Finite field, there's a set of elements that something has to belong to. In this case, this is whole integers. Whole integers that is modulus this. So it's between zero and essentially one minus. You can't actually be the prime, so you'd wrap back round at that point. Um, P mod P is zero. That's, that's gonna be the maximum number we can have. This does something interesting to our picture. This is what it used to look like. When we apply it to, think of two things. One, there's now a modulus where it will wrap around, but also now it's in this fixed field of integers. So it's only gonna be whole points. It's not gonna be a curve anymore. It's just gonna be points where the curve happens to intersect 
with one, two, three, four. So instead of looking like that, what we're now going to end up with is a grid. So the grid is going to be from zero to essentially p minus one in both axes. There's no negative anymore. Modulus is always positive. So that, that's a key thing to understand. So modulus, the remainder, is always positive. If I think, if I do minus four mod 10, what's the modulus of that? It's six. Whereas if you think about, well, four modulus 10, the remainder would be four, but not if it's negative. You have to be able to raise it up into a whole number, and it's what's left after that. And that's really the, the key point of how this is going to work. If I was to do minus 16 mod 10, well, 10 minus six, I have to add another 10, so it would be four. And that's kind of weird to wrap your head around. There's different ways I can think about this. One way is if I have a negative number, I just have to keep adding the modulus to it until it becomes a positive number. So minus 16, I add 10, which is minus six. Okay, add 10 again, well now it's six. So add 10 again, minus six, well now it's four. That works that way. Another way to think about this could be, normally when we do math, we find the smallest, closest multiple of what we're dividing by and then we look at the remainder. So for example, if I took the idea of 12 mod five, how would we in our head divide 12 by five? Well, okay, well, five times two is 10. So we would sort of do 12 minus that. Okay, good, well, that equals two. So I'm at that remainder. Well, if it's minus 12, so how many times do I have to get something less than the number that's the closest multiple? It's not minus two times. Minus two times five would be minus 10. Minus 10 is bigger than minus 12, which is minus. So I would have to do minus three times five. So that's minus 15. So minus 12 minus minus 15, well that's minus 12 plus 15, is three. Whole point of all of that is it's why our chart is going to always be on the positive. There's never gonna be a negative number when I'm modulus, modulus. The other point of this is because essentially what's happening is if it was previously less, it becomes the prime number minus what it used to be. So I could imagine this line in the midsection. So at the middle, say P over two, just imagine that line is there. It's not important, but what's gonna happen is when I start to plot the points, so remember it's only gonna plot a whole unit points. So only if it, the curve happened to intersect at a point, so there's a point here. Well, there will be a symmetric on the x-axis point up here as well. One, two, three, one, two, three. There'd be a point here. There's a point here, there'd be a point here. It's gonna be symmetric, always gonna be symmetric. And so on, I'm not gonna try and do it, but it's gonna be symmetric points through all of these because, remember there's always two points, the curve was always symmetric. So there's a point here, there was gonna be a point here there's a point here, there's gonna be a point there. But if this was negative, remember, modulus, negative, well this point would now flip up high on the positive, because it's the prime minus what the number was. If this was minus two, and let's say this was 10, minus two is gonna become eight. So it's gonna have a point two and a point eight. If this was really low, let's say this was minus eight, so I'd have a point eight up here, well this minus eight modulus 10 would now be two. So, I have these, so it's gonna keep the symmetry because I'm always now reflecting this idea of P minus Y. So I'm still gonna get a symmetry, but it's gonna be at the prime divided by two point now. 
And we can see this. Let's, if we look at one of these, let's go and have a look at, uh, I've got a link somewhere, let's have a look. Let's find my pretty picture. All right. So here's an example. This is what elliptic curve over a finite field looks like. I'm gonna change the numbers so it's a bit busier. Let's do 42, 32, 97. But you see they're symmetric. So this is, the prime is 97, so it's zero to 96, we see. But we also see it's basically symmetrical on half that number. So if I was to draw a line, imagine here-ish, pretty, pretty terrible line, but you get the idea. It's symmetrical as a point on each side. And all we're now gonna do is everything applies exactly the same. Nothing has really changed here. It's working exactly the same way. But now when G, G is just gonna, it's still intersecting lines. I'm just adding G is gonna jump around these points. Now if the intersecting line goes off the page, it's just gonna start again at the other page. So I'd have like a line, line. It, um, imagine I was playing pool and I hit the ball and it bounced off the cushion. Instead of it bouncing off the cushion, it would come back to the opposite cushion. Asteroids, the old asteroids game where the asteroid went off the screen and it would come at the bottom of the screen and keep going up. The line would just carry on until it hit something. So I'm still doing exactly the same thing. There's still, and now I'm not gonna be symmetrical anymore. I mean, I'm just gonna start randomly. I need some more points. But you can get the idea, there's a bunch of points. And I'd have the same idea that I've got this generator. Well then it, maybe that's 2G, maybe, I don't know, 3G, 4G, 5G. And eventually it's gonna wrap back round. It'll go to a point of infinity and then I'm back to G. So there's a certain size, there's a certain number of things. Now, if we go back to our picture, there's an interesting property it's telling us. The interesting property it's telling us is there's 106 points. It's not showing that infinity, the special one I talked about. So there's 106 points on this. So the 106 points, when I think about the, the chart, and I'm just, we'll just say, I'm gonna call it T, it's not actually important, but there's a total number of points on this. And this is called the order of the group. It's based on my settings, the A, remember I still passed in A and B, A and B were still parameters to this, and G, so I've got A, B, and G so far. So I've got this, so let's just draw that in. So we've got A and B, are parameters that I passed in. We've got G, which is our generator. Now, there's actually some special things. I've simplified it greatly, as you could imagine, when I think about this. But with this G, depending on where I start, if I keep adding it to itself, eventually it's gonna come back to itself. But when does it come back to itself? How many points does it jump through until it comes back to itself? If we go back to the site, the site does a really nice thing. It lets me pick a certain point. So remember, there's 106 total. We know this. If we go down, I can pick certain points. What it tells me is how many points and what's the points it jumps through to get back to itself. So this one, for example, is only 53. To get back to itself, notice it gets to infinity, once it hits infinity, it's gonna bounce back to its starting point. And notice the inverse is P minus, P is 97, minus two gives 95. It's that inverse I was talking about. So 53, so it doesn't even go through half the number of points. If I pick a different one, oh, this one's 106, well, half. This one, the order of the subgroup if I keep adding it to itself and itself and itself, it goes through every single point on that chart until it hits infinity. Well, that's nice. That's like, I'm not wasting anything here. So in addition to these things here, we have an N. N is the order of, and I've switched lowercase, of the subgroup. And that then gives us H. H is the total number 
divided by. So how many in total points are there divided by how many of the points am I using if I start at G and keep adding G till I get back to itself? This is called the cofactor of the subgroup. And in an ideal world, what's really, really nice if we can get to is one. If I can be one, I'm using up every single point. That, that's really the ideal scenario. I'm not wasting any of the points here. Now, as you can imagine, um, this is not a, a simple thing to come up with these. Remember, these have to be huge as well. That's, that's really the whole point of this. So if we went back to our wire trace for a second, and let's go and look at our server parameters again. So the server key exchange, Where's my server key exchange? There we go. It told me I'm doing elliptic curve, Diffie-Hellman. Yep, it's a named curve. So there are specific curves we use. And it told me which curve. And then it told me my public key. Well, that's nice. So if we actually go and look at that curve. So my curve in this case is, it's telling me what the, the curve is. My particular curve I'm using is S E C P two five six that's a five uh, R one, which is also known as NIST P dash two five six, which we've seen. So this has very specific parameters for this curve. These are not just random made up G's and um, the A and the B and the prime, these are all set. So this particular curve, if we look, we can see here's the namings. So we can see different namings for the different curves. So here I can sort of see those different names um, defined as part of them over here. But if we actually look, this is an example of that curve, it's got the values. Got our prime, our A, our B, our generator, which remember is actually an X, Y coordinate. So you see two, the X coordinate, the Y coordinate. We see the N, and we see the H. And notice it's one. We have this nice, perfect, we're not wasting anything, we're using everything. So that we've got the, the P, remember that's the prime we're using for the modulus, the A and the B that we feed into the formula. The G, our starting point, our N, the order of the subgroup, how many points out of it we use, and then H, the cofactor of the subgroup, what's the total number of points divided by our order? Well, it's one, so we're using all of them. So this is a really nice trace that we have here. So this is a good thing. So we have all these different values that we have available to us. So how does this actually get used then? Um, how are we using these G values? Like, what do, we, what do we do with this thing to make it useful? Well, at this point, we've set the named curve, and they're all fixed values. The G, everything about this is public. Like, these are all fixed public bits of information. So, we're gonna do the same thing. But this time, we have this curve. So we have a named curve. And the curve has the parameters. It tells us what that order of the subgroup is. We know n. So what each side is going to do is come up with a number. So my number is going to be less than or equal to, um, I'm going to create a key. I'm going to pick a number between that. So let's say this is Ethan's key. It has to be less than the order of the subgroup. And on the server side, I'm going to come up with the same. One less than or equal, and the key is going to be server that has to be less than the order of the subgroup. All I'm gonna do is take the generator, the starting point, times it by my key, a number of times. Times is just add. I'm gonna keep bouncing G around. And I'm gonna share that. I'm gonna tell it the end position. When I times G by my number, this is where it ended up. Remember, it's dotting around and repeating to itself. I don't know what the original starting point was. All I know is where it is right now. 
That's in the public domain. So that's public again. They're going to do exactly the same thing. G times their key and then send it to me. I can then take that position. So what I know is G times their position. So I know where they are right now. And then I'll times it by my key. So if you think about the bouncing around, they took the starting position and, I should go this picture. They took the starting position and they've bounced around a whole bunch of times and they've told me they're currently here. Okay, they got to here. I'm now gonna times it, which is again adding a certain number of times. So my final position will be here. I took G and times it by my thing, so I ended up here. They will then times it by their number, they will end up at the same point. That's the whole idea. I'm timesing it by a number, timesing it by a number, but it doesn't matter which order you do them in, I'm gonna end up at exactly the same point. So the whole goal of this is, hey, I'm gonna end up at a point on this side. There they're gonna keep adding G their number of times, and this will be the same point. Once again, if I'm in the public, I see these values. I see, this is the public, I see this. We see it sent over that plain text. If I go and look at the Wireshark again, we see the public key. We see this, what, roughly five, 12 bits. We can see the number. It's right there. But the whole point is, I can't reverse that. I can't go back, actually I think it's, I guess it's like 520 bits. I think there's a, a byte added to the end. So it's basically 256 um, times two bytes to get an extra byte. But I see this 65 bytes, but it's public. I can't work back. This is the elliptic curve discrete log problem. It's even harder. And this is why the key is smaller. Notice the key, from the server is only, let's say 520 bits. My math may be off. So that was the, wait, wait, that was the server. And if you look at the client, the client also sends their public key, which is also, let's say 65 bytes. So 520 bits, whatever that is. They were a lot smaller than regular Diffie-Hellman, which remember had to be huge. And it's because the discrete logarithm problem is actually easier than the elliptical curve discrete logarithm problem. So this means that I can use a much, much smaller key and get the same level of security. So in this case, it's about a tenth. For a 2048-bit regular Diffie-Hellman, I can use a 256-bit elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman and have the same amount of security. So this is the whole point of what we have. So at this point right now, we have the same point. And what typically is then done is, remember these are coordinates, we typically just use x. So we take x, and this is basically our pre-master secret. And this is the most complicated thing we're doing. Everything at this point on is gonna get easier than this. We're gonna feed all of this in. We're also gonna feed in the client random. We're also gonna feed in the server random. And then we're actually gonna feed in the string master secret. I'm not even kidding. These four bits of information go in, and what you get out is the master secret. The master secret is then actually split to create the symmetric key. So you have a different symmetric key for each direction. Why not? Better security. So it uses one symmetric key one way, a different symmetric key the other way. They both know both keys, but it just, it uses a different key. Okay. And I mean, that's, that's the fundamental part of this. And the reason it's elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman, if I can find where we said it, so, elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman E, the E just means 
uh, ephemeral. I, it's thrown away. It's not a long-term key. It's used and then it uses a different one next time. It's not any kind of long-term data um, that is leveraged. And that's, that's really it. Um, if we actually look for a second at the spec, and this is the point, there's a detailed spec for everything we're talking about here. But this is, there's that pre-master secret they've worked out. There's the literal string master secret. Client hello and random hello gives us the master secret. And then once again, it's gonna take that and then split it up and do things to actually work out the two separate keys it will actually use for the encryption. Okay, so looking good at this point, remember, we now have a, a key that we can use for symmetric encryption. There's one problem. Um, we're not protected against some person in the middle. So what we've done is on the public network, we have shared materials that even though the materials are public, only when we can combine our private parts do we get the final endpoint. That's great. But this communication is happening over this public network. And there's actually nothing in anything we've done as just part of this on its own that doesn't stop some bad person in the middle, this time a different terrible human being, we call them Sean, getting in the middle and maybe intercepting packets and changing it. So I'm actually talking to Sean and they're talking to Sean and he's kind of man in the middle doing bad things. So I wanna stop that. If we looked at the actual encryption we're using, it wasn't just elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman, it was elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman underscore RSA. Revest Shamir Edelman. So we're gonna use the RSA to give us the authenticity to know we're really talking to the end point. So what I wanna now do is, I'm, this is elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman, ephemeral is not changing. We're not changing anything about that flow. But what I want to be able to now do is have some element that I can encrypt as part of it to prove, hey, it really did come from this person. Remember, we have the certificate. We know we have the certificate, which we've tracked through that trusted chain. So we know there's a certificate. We know there's a private key the server has that I have the public key access to. So I know I can use that as part of, hey, some secure type communications. So my solution to this problem is gonna be RSA. So how does RSA work? Now, I'm gonna say magic. There's certain magic things we can do with numbers. Uh, think of a number, double the number, add nine to it. Subtract three with the result of that. Divide the result by two. Um, subtract the number with the first number you started with. The answer is three. That's the number. Three is your end result. So the things we can do in math that certain operations will always come round to either back to itself, which is what we care about here, or to some fixed result. So RSA is all based around finding two huge prime numbers. So what we're going to start with with RSA is the idea of two very large primes. Cannot stress the importance of how large these primes need to be. Super, super large primes. So I've got P1, prime one, and I've got prime two. Now we're gonna be able to forget about these primes long term. I just need them initially. And again, there are some certain th values we want from this, some certain properties of it, but we're gonna think of two huge primes. We're gonna multiply them, and this is gonna give us N. Now this is actually gonna be our modulus. 
and we saw this when we looked at a public certificate, one of the things we saw, remember, was modulus, that huge, huge, ugly, ugly number. If we go back for a second, let's view our certificate again. We look at the details and I go and look at the key. First, remember, it told us the algorithm, RSA, but then it said modulus, 2048 bits. It's really, really big. And it showed us the modulus, so it's not a secret. And then it gave us a public exponent, 010001, because that's in hex. Okay, so it told us that number. So we know there's a huge modulus, and then this exponent is actually not that bad, but that, that's shared as well. And the reality is that exponent is nearly always going to be that value. It's just what's leveraged, and we'll, we'll see why. So we get a modulus. Now, what we then have to do is some other things with these huge primes we picked. I cannot work with very, very large primes. I'm going to work with very, very small primes. So imagine I picked 5 and 11. This is terrible, but that's going to give me a modulus of 55. 5 times 11 is 55. What I then have to do is I take P1 and subtract 1 from it, and P2 and subtract 1 from it, and I times them together. So this would give me 4 and 10 is 40. So this is really a temporary modulus we're going to use for something. Now, what I have to then pick, I have to pick a prime that cannot divide this number. Cannot divide into that number. So I pick something, and let's say I pick 17. So I'm going to pick 17, and that's going to be E. That's going to be one of the magic numbers we're going to have. What I then require for this to work is D. And I need it to be that D times E modulus this number, and this is kind of a, t a temporary number, modulus that number, x, has to equal 1. That's my requirement. This is one of my magic numbers, my special numbers. This is that, the number we saw, the public exponent part, because we're picking that. But now we have to work out this other d value. Um, and that's a, a lot trickier to actually go and do that. But for computers, it's actually not that hard. Um, for computers, there's actually a special algorithm, the extended U Euclidean algorithm, that gives us that. I'm not going to work out the math for that, but basically the answer is 13. So the answer to this would be 13, sorry, not 13. The answer would be 33 for D times 17 mod 40 equals 1. And we can check that. So if we go back to our little calculator for a second, let's check our math is good there. So if we move this over, so I can't even see my numbers. Let's clear this for a second. So if I said 33 times 17 mod 40, nope, I did something wrong. Oh, I did 14. So, Math is hard for me today. 33 times 17 mod 40 is 1. So it meets my requirements. And if you think about it logically, remember what we said before about exponents. If I raise something to the power and then raise it to the power again, it's really the same as just taking those two exponents times each other and raising something to the power. It's like I'm spinning round the clock my clock now is 40, and I get back to 1. So I'm going to be able to do something with this number, raise something to this number, that if I then raise it again to this number, this d, it's going to get back around the clock to 1, i.e. I'm going to times it by 1, it's back on itself. So I would have undone what I did. And that's really the, the key point of all of this. 
I've now got my two numbers. So I know D, this is what I'll keep private. I know E that's public and the modulus, this, this 55. Again, there'd be much, much larger numbers, but this is the whole point of RSA. So what we have is the idea that I will keep super private, D is private. N, the modulus, and E is public. That's the public exponent. So if someone wants to send something to me, well the cipher text is gonna be equal to the plain text raised to the power of E mod N. And then for me to decrypt that, to get the plain text, all I do is I take the cipher, what they sent me, I raise it to the power of D mod N. And again, it works in either direction. Um, what you saw in that certificate was E was hexadecimal 10001, which is 65,537. And this is highly typical. The, if you look at any public cert, it's nearly always gonna be that value. There's again, some clever things that have happened with this that make this work. Um, so yeah, let's do a test, actually, it's be fun. So in our case, remember we have 17 and 33 are our two numbers, modulus 55. So if I go and get the calculator again, now, I have to convert it to a number, but let's think of a, a number. So if I think of um, 42, the ultimate answer. So if I raise 42 to the power of 17, and then modulus that, wait, did I do that? No, hold on, let me clear that again. Maybe I did that right. If I do 42, to the power of 17, it's a huge number, modulus 55, okay? That was sent to me, that was encrypted with my public key. So if I now take 37 and raise it to the power of 33, and I modulus that with 55, I get 42 again. And it would work the other way around. If I take 42, I mean, it's pretty obvious at this point. But if I took 42, raised it to the power of my private key, and then modulus 55 and sent it to them, if they then raised that to the power of my public key, and modulus that with 55, they get back to 42. So this is RSA, that's it. There's other stuff. Now, the important part here though, remember, the value has to be less than the modulus. I, if my modulus was 55, which is terrible, I couldn't do 67. Because what's happened? Well, the modulus is gonna wrap around and then wrap around an additional time and land somewhere else on the clock, it'll break. So I can only send as much data that's less than the size of my modulus. So that's one of the requirements of what I can do here. There's often padding is added to this, and so there's a certain amount of randomness that looks like it's in there. I want the encrypted value to be non-deterministic. I don't want to be able to tell anything from what is sent over it. And that's it. I mean, we have now done that key exchange, and we, we feel pretty good about that. Now, one of the things that it does with this certificate, to the fact that it can actually now check this value, is when the server sends, let's look at the Wireshark again, when it sends its key, so that's the whole point, if we look at the server key exchange, it sent its public key, absolutely, but it then sent it with a signature. So it generated a signature that summarizes that data that the other client receiving it could now validate and say, oh, that really is them. Uh, I feel good about that. There's not some bad thing has gone and changed it and I'm not really speaking. So I guess we should talk about that as well. Um, I'm saying, hey, 
what actually happens is that as part of this key exchange, what well actually, when I sent this part here, I'm actually adding a hash to it. So the reality is really, there's this hash is really added onto that, that is encrypted with the private key. That's, that's what's going on so that I, I did the wrong one, didn't I? I'm an idiot. No, I'm not, that's the right one. It's just that I should shift it over a bit. I add that on the end of this so that they can validate it. Now, I'm not gonna go into a huge amount of things about the hashing um, because a lot of the operations, we do the same with the encrypted data. So I'm gonna go over it pretty quick. But at a very high level, the whole, when I hash, when I create a hash, the whole point of what I'm gonna get is, well, I know it was SHA-384. And 384 is just the size of the hash value. So it's gonna give me a fixed size. No matter what size data I put into it, I'm gonna get that. There's also uh, SHA-256, which will give me a 256-bit value. We saw that in the key exchange as some other things it was doing as well. Now, the whole point of a hash is it should summarize the data that it's creating the hash of, but there's some very specific requirements that we have. It should be, I'm gonna do it green, these things I want. I want it to be determ Ministic. Same message data you're in should always give me the same hash value. It needs to be not too hard, not too easy. <laughs> if it's too hard to generate the hash and it takes forever, it's not practical, especially when I have smaller form factor devices. If it's a server with lots of connections, it doesn't want to spend huge amounts of CPU doing this. But it doesn't mean too easy. If it's too easy, I could try and find something that matches a hash value with different content. It should appear random. There shouldn't be anything from the hash that gives me some insight into what's in the original content, the original text. I want something called the avalanche effect. What this means is if I change a single bit, one bit, the hash is completely different. It's not just the hash is a little bit different, it would be completely different. And I wanna avoid hash collisions. I don't want the chance that two things would generate the same hash. And I can show this whole idea of, there's a nice little site. This generates the SHA. This is 256, I mean I can do different things down here. If I put in the input on board to azure.com, this is my hash value down the bottom. If I change just M to N, one character, oh, it's completely different. So N, M, there's nothing similar at all. So that's the avalanche effect. That's, that's one byte had one bit flipped potentially, I mean, there's one difference in those. Avalanche effect, completely different. And it's complicated enough that I probably can't find some completely different string that would come up with that hash value. I have no way of trying to fake something that will get the same hash so then I could fake the content of a message so I get the same hash. Remember the hash is gonna be used for, to check the integrity. That hash is gonna get encrypted with their private key sent to me I then generate the hash myself and I want it to match what's been encrypted from them. Well, if someone could somehow tweak that content of message to match the same hash, that would be a problem. So I don't want that. And the way this really works is if I, if I think about the process, I can have a source string of any length, and that's the point. It can be really short, it can be really long, it does not matter. But the data coming in going to get broken down into chunks of 1,024 bits. I mean, it actually then puts it into 64 words. There's a whole bunch of stuff it does. But what the SHA 
is actually going to do is the whole point of this is it has this internal state. And that internal state is constantly going to be updated as it brings in more and more data. But it's just this internal state, which is this H0 through to H7. And what it does is the data gets fed in I get this uses some temporary variables, it's A to H, and it just does a whole bunch of stuff 80 times, as 80 rounds, and it will then update that internal state. Now, inside this random stuff, it's doing many different things. It's rotating things around, it's shifting bits, it's combining them with various constants based on primes, it's XORing the bits together, and it's doing that 80 times. So it's going to completely scramble all of this. Uh, we can actually see there's constants that it uses. They're public. Because remember, it has to be able to repeat this. It has to be consistent. It appears random, but there's nothing random about it at all. It has to always be deterministic. The same input will always give the same hash. So there's a whole bunch of constants it uses. There'll be other data in here about the initial state of that internal state. There's the H0 to H7. So it's all very specific, but the whole point is what it's doing is just running through this over and over again. So it's going to spit this out, and what this is actually doing is doing something called an XOR, exclusive OR, which we're going to see again. And it's just going to keep reading in. So then that's going to feed back up as it reads in another 100,024 bits until everything's been done. When it's finished, we get the hash value. That's the output. It's going to dump out that internal state. That's our value. And that's the point. So that the whole idea here is then, once we've got that hash, we would take the hash, specifically though, we have to convert it to a number, remember? And there's many different ways that we express things as numbers. It's, it's easy for us to do. We're going to raise that. This is my private key to with D mod N. And I can send that. So this is how we use the hash. So the whole point here is I would then send this hash. So I would have generated that in this instance. That gets sent along with the the actual data that was fed in, so the data is obviously sent, this is added to the bottom of that message. At the other end, they regenerate the same, they use the same algorithm to generate the hash. And then they decrypt the signature to get the hash, and they should be the same. I want a match. If they match, I know the message has not been messed with, it's not been tampered with, and I know it came from them because only they have the private key. So all of that, that's the whole point of everything we're doing. That's everything I want to do. So all of this, where are we? There's my picture. All of this so far, we've got to this point, what do we have? And I'm sure I've gone off center, but that is what it is. What we have at this point, we have a shared secret that we trust. We have a set shared secret, so we are super happy. Yay. Very, very happy. So we got this, remember, through the elliptic curve, Diffie, Hellman, ephemeral, authentication, integrity, RSA. Okay. Now I need to actually <laughs> encrypt some. I'm not actually encrypted anything yet. So now what I need to do is take that key and use it to actually encrypt. And this actually gets easier. So my encryption, this is where I do the AES256 Galois counter mode. And when we look at this, the component really is advanced encryption standard. The advanced encryption standard actually came from a competition. So there was a call for, we need a new type of encryption. 
So this was originally created by uh, Randall, Randall. They won the competition. It was then renamed to the Advanced Encryption Standard because it won. This here is the key length. There were a whole bunch of parameters that the encryption winner had to meet to. Again, about oh, how hard is it computationally? Um, how secure is it? So we have different key lengths. So I can have 128, 192, and 256. And where these get important is there's a certain number of rounds. We saw those rounds with the hashing. We have a certain number of rounds with this as well. So I have 10 rounds, 12 rounds, and 14 rounds. Remember we have a shared key now. This is the cornerstone of everything we're gonna do because this is gonna be symmetric. This is a block cipher currently. It's gonna encrypt one block at a time. It's based on something called an SP network. An SP network is substitution, that's the S, switching things for other things. The P is permutations, moving stuff around. And what we're gonna think is we're gonna read in 128 bits at a time. No matter which key length we use, it's still 128 bits. Now remember, what we have is that shared secret. Now that shared secret member was used to create multiple symmetric keys. So I'm gonna have my key that I'm using. And what we actually do is we have to break it into other multiple keys so I can use a different key for different rounds of what I'm gonna do. So we have something called a key scheduler. And it's gonna create a number of keys based on how many rounds. So in my case, it's gonna create round zero through to round 14. So yes, it's 15 keys in total because there's an initial key and then it has one for each of the rounds. So it's gonna have an encryption function. Think about this um, set of things that it's gonna do. It's gonna repeat those set of things a certain number of times. That's everything we have. So I have my data that I want to encrypt. And that data is gonna be read in 128 bits. So 16 bytes. Now the way it's gonna work is it brings it into, because it's 16 bytes, 16 bytes is perfect for a four by four grid. And I can think of it as byte zero, byte one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all the way down to byte 15. So this is column, major, uh oh, the whiteboard's starting to get unhappy with the number of, uh, amount of writing I've done on it. Remember those round keys. So the first thing it's gonna do is actually XOR this, you're gonna see XOR over and over again with round key zero, that first round key. Then what it does, it feeds it in to an S box. An S box is substitutions. Substitution. And these are fixed. Um, if I can, let's see if I can find the link. Um, we can see what these are. If we go and look, keep scrolling down. Oh, I think it's page 16, I've got it in my notes. There we go. So it looks them up. It looks up, um, so eight, it's one byte, so it looks up the four bit by four bit, so the X and the Y, and it finds the mapping of what it should substitute to. So it's fairly easy, it's just swapping stuff out. That's uh, it's nothing complicated about that at all. So it's gonna do some substitutions. Remember, it's not even the original bits at this point though, so it's already XORed it with this round key, which is based on our key. So don't forget about the fact that this is using our key. Well, we have brought in our round key. So this, maybe I should make this like really clear. This, was, remember, was based all off of our special secret source. So even though everything else is public, every, the shifting, everything is public, no one has these keys except me and the, the server, or the server and me. It's a shared secret. 
that generated these round keys. So this is substituted stuff. Then, well, so now I've still got the grid, but my grid's been muddled up. Now what I have is the substituted bytes. It does rotate rows. The um, first row is not touched. Second row shifts left one. Third row shift left two. Third row shift left, left three, which is really shift in white one, if you, if you think about it. So that means, hey, this bit jumps to that byte, this bit jumps to this, this jumps to this. This one, well, it goes to there. Shift two, okay, well, this one goes to there, this one goes to there, this one, okay, that one goes to there, that one, you get the idea. Three, that goes to there, but really that just goes there, that goes there. So we've shifted all the rows around, okay? Then what we're gonna do, there is some crazy math that happens. There is now a column matrix multiplication. This matrix multiplication happens in this Galois field of two to the eight, all again to make sure as I start multiplying, normally things would go outside of that range. I have to keep it within that range. So the Galois field is used to keep it. So I can do plus and minus and times and divide. It will keep it, it won't overflow, it won't underflow, it's gonna keep it in this specific size. That's the whole point of what I want in here. But it's gonna do this whole set of things. This is now gonna jumble up at the column level. So everything's getting scattered within the individual column. And then, whichever round this is, then round key, whatever it is, is XORed in with that output. So all of this, all of this part, remember, was the permutation. And then all of this bit was a round. And remember, I'm going to repeat. So then I'm going to go back round <laughs> as many times as the number of rounds I'm having. This column is not done on the last round. Then once it's finished, once it's gone round 10, 12, in my case, 14 times, I get out the cipher text. Simple, right? Um, it's a lot of shifting. The good news is a lot of processors, Intel, AMD, etc., have this built onto their chips. So for example, there's an A, E, S, E, N, C, and there's different instructions for initial round, subsequent rounds, all of those. So I think it's just like four cycles or something. It's really not a lot of CPU work to do all of this because it's built into the hardware now. And because of that, I could do gigabytes of data um, in a second. So it's crazy how efficient, like BitLocker uses AES. So it, that's why I don't really see a delay when I encrypt my disk, because it's using this super, super efficient um, sets of capabilities. So you might say at this point, well, John, you're done. This is fantastic. So remember, it's operating on those chunks of data. So I have all my plain text coming in, plain text zero, plain text one, plain text n, etc. All of these get fed into my encryption box, which basically has the same key. Remember that then inside the encryption box, it breaks it into round keys, but all good. And then what I get out is my awesomely encrypted ciphertext. Perfect, no issue whatsoever. So this is AES. I'm gonna show you a picture I encrypted with AES 128. Just uh, open this up. And you see, so you can't tell anything about that picture whatsoever. If we look at it. Uh, well, there's actually a problem there, right? 
I mean, if I zoom in, now I can't tell at all. This was a picture. I can't tell at all what the original colors were in any way. But if you think about what it's doing, it's operating on blocks. So if a block was the same, it's gonna spit out the same ciphertext. So in this case, where there's areas of my picture that were the same color, it gives out the same ciphertext, which in this case, when it's a PPM file, which is what I used, and I converted it to a JPEG so I could show it, I can infer data about this picture. That's not a good thing. I should not be able to infer anything. So that's obviously a problem. Um, and this is where that Galois counter mode comes in. Because what we have right here, this is something called electro electronic code book mode. And it really harkens back to the days where there was a book and you would, no, uh, why don't I do a happy face? That's not good, it should be a sad face. This is not good, this is terrible. So I can infer data. I did a picture, imagine it was a, a money or a transaction I kept doing or well, someone looking won't know the details, but they know I'm doing the transaction again, if it was the same content. I should not be able to tell anything from that. So this is not an acceptable thing. If you think of Enigma, well, Enigma worked on really a block size of one character at a time. It had very fancy substitutions, but this is where they would look for things like weather report at the start, and they know most things started with weather reports, so it helped them try and crack the code. There should be nothing deterministic. I should not get the same ciphertext for the same input, but that doesn't make sense because by the very definition, I'm running the same algorithm. So how do we solve this? One thing we could do is something called cipher block chaining. I need some kind of initialization vector, something to start with. And then what I have is once again, I'm not gonna do all the colors this time. I wanna be a bit quicker. I can XOR with this initialization vector and then run it through my encryption function and that's my ciphertext zero. So far so good. I'll take the output of this and then I actually XOR it with the next bit of plain text. So I'm muddling it up, right? Even if these were the same, any of them were the same, because I'm mixing it with the output of the other one, it's gonna be random. It will, well, it's not random, it will look random. Even if it's the same plain text in, because I'm mixing it, XORing it with the previous block, it's gonna look different. And we can think about n number of times until we get to the last one. This seems really good. But there's a, a challenge with this approach. These were all independent. What's nice about that is I can run them in parallel. I could be encrypting all of these on different threads all at the same time. So I get great parallelism, I get great performance, I'm very, very happy. Well, this relies on the output of the one before it, which relies on the output of the one before it. I can't run it in parallel anymore. I have to run it one after each other in series which means the performance is gonna be horrible. There's also challenges with potentially, well, maybe the decryption. Now the decryption, remember I've been given the ciphertext. I should still be able to jump around. I should still be able to potentially decrypt in parallel because all I need at that point is the ciphertext. But it, it's, it's just not a great solution. We don't like that. I can't run it in series. It, it doesn't work. So there's another option over here, is the idea of a counter mode. The counter mode, let's just write counter mode. I still have an initialization vector. And I'm gonna concatenate it to a counter. So initially it would be zero. And what I do is I feed this into the encryption function. And notice what happened. I fed this initialization vector concatenated with a counter that's going up into the encryption function, not my plain text. And then I XOR with my plain text, which gives me my cipher block. Initialization vector concatenated with the next number, 
I run through, XORed with my next bit of plain text, gives me the next bit, all the way through to initialization vector N. Because remember, this encryption function doesn't matter if this is only one number more, it will give out a completely different value. Remember, it messed all the rows, it substituted, it moved columns, there'll be complete, not random, appearing random coming out of these. There'll be nothing similar about these at all. And remember, my key is still in here. That symmetric key is powering generating these numbers, so no one else can generate what this is spitting out. So I get to PN. So I get cipher block N. This is actually nice. And there's, I can run it in parallel again. Because I know the block number, the count I can work out, I can run that in complete parallel. And there's also an interesting function of this because I'm just XORing the result, I run it again to decrypt. There's not a separate decryption function. If I XOR and XOR, it reverses itself, which is a, a, a nice thing. So I don't have to write a separate decryption. I just rerun it to decrypt. But the point is, this would be ciphertext zero XORed with this result, which would give me out plain text zero. It's actually really cool when I, when I consider the, how that works. I mean, if we think, for example, just a very simple, simple example. Imagine the, this spat out one, zero, zero, one as my pattern. This is my plain text. And then the output of the encryption block, let's say it was one, one, zero, one. Okay. If I XOR those, so XOR it has to be exclusive OR. So if it's one and one, it spits out zero. So this is zero, one. I don't like what I've done here. Okay. Zero, zero. Because one and one is zero, 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 zero. So only if one of them is one and the other is zero, I get a one. So that's my encrypted, that, that's my ciphertext. So decrypt it, if I feed in my ciphertext back into the key exclusive or again, because remember, I can work out the encryption key at the other end, got the same symmetric keys, same round keys, same algorithm. So if I now feed in what I was sent with the encryption key, well, exclusive or, so I get one, exclusive or, oh no, zero, exclusive or, zero, exclusive or, one. They match. I'm happy. So that proves that point that I don't have to have a separate algorithm. It's just going to work. And to prove a point that it does work, that was my original picture, remember? This is the same picture encrypted with the counter mode. I can't say anything. That really is, and let's just switch to it to make sure. It's completely random. So there's a world of difference between that picture and that picture. And the reason some of this is more garbled is where there was shading. But where it was just like this blank color, it was very, very obvious. So you might say at this point, John, you're done. You have solved the challenge of the internet. And I wish I had, but there's still one problem. I still have to worry about the worst people in the world. I still have to worry about the Sean's, oh my God, my pen is like completely falling apart, or Tim. They can do things to this ciphertext. They could do things like bit flipping. There are various types of padding attack. There, there are things they could do with maybe manipulating the data. And so there's one more thing. I would like to validate the authenticity, the integrity of the data. And we saw, this in our algorithm. What we saw all the way back was Galois counter mode. So we know we're using the counter mode, CM, we're doing that initialization vector and we're doing that counter and we're doing it within a Galois field, which again is that finite field of a fixed number of elements. And this is going to add a tag. It's basically going to be like the same idea as the hash, but it's going to be a message authentication code 
that will validate nothing's been tampered with because if a single part is messed with, I won't get the same value. So let's finish this off. We have, uh oh, it's not good, there we go. All right, so we're gonna now use this Galois counter mode. I'm gonna draw very slowly so the pen can keep up. We're gonna have an initialization vector of typically 96 bits. This means I can have a counter so we want 128 bits, because remember that's what AES wants. AES wants 128 bits coming in. So that gives me 32 bits. We still have our key, remember? We still have that key. I'm gonna generate something called H. H is going to be our encryption algorithm with our key. If I feed in all zeros, 128 zeros. This is gonna be used as a base multiplier that I'm gonna use throughout the entire algorithm. And then most of it is actually gonna look the same. We have exactly the same content of the initialization vector, concatenated with the counter one, gets fed into our encryption, which is gonna spit out our ciphertext when we feed in the first bit of plain text. Now I did start with one, and this is actually gonna be plain text zero. You'll see why in a second. And that's gonna be our cipher block zero, and then I carry on um, as I did before. But what's actually happening now is I take this and I feed it into, we call it a G hash, Galois hash, with this H value that I worked out. And I'm just gonna feed this into another thing that's gonna go on. So meanwhile, oh please, my initialization vector is keeps getting concatenated to N messages, so I don't know, I'm now at message N. That got fed in, I got my encryption function, which generated my stuff. I've now read in my message P, um, N, this is minus one, it's one less than where we are. This is gonna give me my cipher text. And I'm gonna XOR it. So I'm gonna keep XORing this hash with the value, and it's gonna keep giving me, feeding that into my new hash. So I'm now generating this hash value that I'm carrying forward through what I'm doing. But what we're actually gonna do is something else as well. Now this is all done within something called a Galois field of two to the one, two, eight. Now this is all using polynomials and it's actually based on this out, this formula that never actually gets evaluated. It's weird stuff. I'm gonna say magic at this point. Magic um, is used. But it's gonna keep it in our 128 bit size. That's, that's the whole point about this. But one of the things we can do, this is called an AEAD, Authenticated Encryption with Associated Data. So imagine this is my encrypted data, but you know what? I might have some other data I also want to send as well. So I might have some additional data. For example, I can't encrypt it. Maybe it's um, part of um, the message header. Maybe there's a sequence on a packet. But I would still like to guarantee it's not been messed with. I'd like it to be part of this G hash. So what we can still do is we can still XOR this, and there's some other stuff, initialization, and this goes into the G hash as well. And this is then gonna feed in XOR to the G hash of that. And then that's gonna feed into the G hash again. And that's gonna actually feed into an XOR of this one. And then what happens at the end is this is gonna feed into an XOR with the length of the associated data all of it, wow, and the length, I'm going right so slowly, of all of the ciphertext. I'm gonna XOR those lengths in there and add that into the hash, the G hash function. <laughs> Finally, it's gonna take the initialization vector concatenated with zero. Notice we started at one. 
The reason is at the end, we'll take zero. We're going to run that through our encryption function. And one more time, we'll take this and XOR it. And this, we call it a tag. That is our message authentication code. That is what we will actually go and add as part of the AES that will prove there was no tampering. That is the final part. So that combined with, so you notice the, the ciphertext still came out the same way. That still is the ciphertext, but then we sort of looked at the value as well and we kept running it through this hash. So that hash includes the associated data that wasn't encrypted. It includes the ciphertext, takes the length of them, takes this initialization vector with zero concatenated, and ultimately I'm gonna end up with a tag that gets added to the data. And we're done. I mean, that, that's all of it. We have gone through, well, that's a really long whiteboard. Okay, so, but that's everything we have done. So we worked out how we can share a key. I'm terrified this board's gonna crash. But we worked out how do we share a secret so we use the elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman. Points, we move the points a certain number of times. We tell it the end point, they move it. We both end up with the same point. We used RSA so the server could validate it really is them that's saying this is their material. So I get the integrity, the authenticity. We can generate SHA hashes through this SHA algorithm that we run through these with the 80 rounds to, to create these hashes. And then to actually send the data, we use the advanced encryption standard substitutions, um, round keys generated from the symmetric key we generated from the master key, which was generated from that pre-shared key, which we sent with the elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman. Then we can encrypt the blocks um, to make sure it's we can't tell anything by looking at the individual blocks, i.e. the picture where it's the same colors. We run it through the Galois counter mode, which not only uses that initialization vector with a counter, so everything's gonna look different all the time. I can use the same algorithm to decrypt, just XORing, but it also creates this tag that it adds to the end, which ensures that integrity that has not been messed with. It's not been changed in any way. And we are done. I mean, that, that's it. Now, I guess I should go back to that whole point about TLS 1.3. So TLS 1.2, remember, was two round trips. Hey, here's what I can do. Here's what I've picked. Here's the key, how we're gonna do the key exchange. Here's the key material. Okay, here's my key material, and we're good to go. So TLS 1.3, remember I said there's two things, and we already saw TLS 1.3 because my client is actually TLS 1.3. So what TLS 1.3 did, in the client hello, remember it still, it lies. It says, hey, I'm 1.2. It's not, it's 1.3, because what happens is in these extensions, I tell it, hey, I also support PS 1.3. This is better. But in my case, my server didn't support 1.3, which is why it used 1.2. But if the server had supported 1.3, I'm telling it also, hey look, these are the curves that I can support for the elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman. And I'm gonna assume that you're probably gonna pick um, a particular curve. So I'm just gonna go ahead and send you my key material. So I'm gonna assume you're gonna pick, and you're okay with me picking this curve, and here's my public key. So it is just initially sending enough data that the server should be okay. It's also, we're gonna look for the things, so the TLS 1.3 is a lot shorter it doesn't have all of the same massive list of Cypher suites that are supported on this. It's a much, much smaller list that it will actually support. But we can see there's different bits of information it's gonna send. And it's just gonna assume that it is going to use a certain 
combination like elliptic curve diffie hellman sending that key as256 etc and if the server had supported that then the server could have just sent back its part of the public key material and you would have been done so it could have just been this single flow of all of the work now there's some other stuff that goes on for example if we look at the spec for a second um, there are some things that help stop certain types of attacks. For example, one of the things we can be worried about is someone might try and get in the middle of the conversation and lie. They might say, actually, the client only supports TLS 1.1. So what happens is in 1.3, if it sees that the client requested 1.2, it will set their random value to a set value. So if the client supports 1.3 and sees this at the end of the server's server random, it'd be like, well, that's odd. I didn't request 1.2. Someone's doing something bad. Now 1.2 has a similar thing if it sees 1.1, but this is not a must, it's a should. So TLS 1.3 really was about, hey, it can shorten down the handshake. So TLS 1.3 could be one round trip. TLS 1.3, threw away a huge number of the su supported cipher suites. It was only, it's the elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman or elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman with a pre-shared key. It enables a, a session resumption if there's already some pre-shared key material. It doesn't support things like RSA just for the key exchange. It, it has to be using those elliptic curves. It did away with a lot of the older, sort of the encryption things. It's a much, much shorter um, set of things. So it locked down the security. It got rid of all the bad stuff off the menu and just gave us the good things. It shortens the handshake potentially if they both support 1.3. And if the client sent something that the server is okay with, as the client, I can also send encrypted data straight away. So there's a concept in the client that it can be a zero round trip. So I can have a zero dash RTT packet. So if there was some existing relationship, I can say, hey, I'm gonna have some zero round trip um, data, zero round trip time data, this is the stuff we did before. I'm gonna use that again. Here's my encrypted data, use it. So that, that's really the big deal. And that's why TLS 1.3 is, is better, but it's not some huge rush to get to because yes, the handshake, I'll half the number of round trip times from two to one. So it will agree things a bit quicker. But if I've made the right choices on the server side to which Cypher suites, it's the same level of security because all the same cipher suites I can do in 1.3, I can do in 1.2. So, and that's what we see here. I'm using a cipher suite that's in 1.3. So the security is actually the same level. So that's why it's not such a huge big deal. All of this is spec'd out in huge amounts of detail if you're really curious about this. But that was it. I mean, that, that's, uh, that's how you are encrypted. I hope, I hope that was kind of, I thought it was fun. Uh, the reason I did this video is like, I was researching it and I thought it was really cool and I was curious, so I wanted to share it. I know it was a huge video and there was a huge amount to it. And so now it's probably time to uh, go and eat something good off the menu. It's time for some pizza. Until next video, take care.